brethren and friends tonight. I want to first of all thank Brother Ellsworth for the energy that he usually exudes in his leading of songs. I want to say good night to all of you who took the time to be here tonight. I want to acknowledge, before I introduce our speaker, Brother Bill McDonald, partner in progress, who have made him available to us. Our speaker, who only came to St. Vincent a few hours ago, thanks to Liat, I'm glad that they didn't delay the flight, otherwise one of you preachers might have been doing the presentation tonight. We didn't want that to happen. But um, first of all, I want to say, he is an outdoor person. He likes the outdoors. He likes hiking. He likes running marathons. He said he loves to cook, but I don't think he get an opportunity to cook in St. Vincent. He's married to Kim. In addition to his wife, he has three children. I think two boys and a girl. That's correct. Who, because of his busy schedule, sometimes don't get a lot of time to spend with him. Indeed, he's recently returned from the Ukraine, and after that he was in Virginia, got home, and probably spent just about nine hours before he took a flight to Trinidad. And is here now, will be returning to Trinidad on Friday to do the workshop there this weekend. Our speaker has a bachelor's degree from Faulkner University and has a did master's studies at Bay Valley. Currently, he works as the director of extension services for the Bay Valley Bible Institute. That institute has extension services in over 20 countries. And that's why our speaker is on the road that often. He loves to train preachers. He loves to teach the gospel. And I believe that he's anxious to share with us this evening his first visit to St. Vincent. So without taking any more of his time, I'm pleased and honored to introduce to us Brother Keith Castiger. I have been looking forward to being with you. I appreciate the invitation, and um, I'm looking forward to being with you tonight and then tomorrow as well. Now, I have to tell you, you use good night as a greeting, and I use it as a goodbye, or if someone is about to go to sleep. So when I was in Trinidad in April, that was the first time I had ever experienced that. Been in more than 50 countries but I had never been somewhere where good night is a greeting. And so when I walked in the first time, it seemed like everybody was telling me to go away. <laughs> I walk in, they said, good night. <laughs> and so now I, I walk up and I'm again told good night. Well, I'm going to adapt and say good night. I'm, I'm glad to be with you this evening. Uh, I was in Trinidad because they reached out to us at Bear Valley to partner with them to uh, sort of improve the Trinidad School of Preaching. Went and surveyed that in April. We decided that was a good thing, and all the parties together have agreed to partner. And so as of last month, uh, Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver, which has been training preachers in the U.S. since 1965, is now partner with another great institution, the Trinidad School of Preaching. And, uh, and we are excited about that. So, your young men who want to train to preach, I want to encourage you to send them to, to San Fernando, uh, which is where I will be on this weekend as well. And, and so, uh, I am excited about that possibility. It is my first time in your beautiful country, and I have been here about three hours now. And I have enjoyed every one of them so far. I was asked to talk about something that is important. It is the subject of evangelism. You know, evangelism is one of those words we don't use in any other context, is it? Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a word we use any other way except 
in this setting. And sometimes even then it seems like an odd concept. Maybe it even sounds too specified. Maybe it sounds too much like it's not something that all of us can do. But I'm here tonight to tell you that it is and that it should be something that all of us are involved in. But the truth is, most of us are not. Is that true here? I mean, I haven't been here long, but I am assuming that most of us are not involved actively in being soul conscious. And something is wrong and something needs to be fixed. And we should be alarmed by that. You see, our lack of being soul conscious has led to the fact that many churches are not growing. In fact, many churches are actually shrinking in number. And that's not the way it should be. A healthy organism grows. And if we are soul conscious, then we're going to be making some efforts that we aren't currently making. Can you imagine any business where people are not really focused on the objective of that business? It's not going to do well. It's, sometimes we forget. You see, the problem is not the gospel. It's still the good news, right? It's still the good news, still the best news that we have ever had. The problem isn't the gospel. The problem is not that there are no prospects. You see, we are surrounded by people who are lost, right? It's like someone asked the farmer, what time do you go to work? And he said, I don't go to work. When I wake up, I am surrounded by it. We think about lost souls. We are surrounded. So the problem is not the gospel. The problem is not that there are no prospects. The problem is we have forgotten four things. And tonight, those will be the four things that we will focus on to bring ourselves a reminder. I'm not going to tell you anything you do not already know, okay? I'm going to take the pressure off. I'm not going to tell you anything you do not know. But I do want to remind us of some things that we must keep in mind, that we must be conscious of. The first thing that I am convinced we have forgotten is there really is a hell. There really is a place called hell. And I think from a practical standpoint, we have forgotten that. And I, I don't mean that we don't believe in hell, although did you know there are now many people who profess to be Christians who don't believe that hell exists? You know that? It's, it's hard to believe, but it's true. In fact, they did a survey of 500 preachers. These were not members of the Lord's Church, but 500 preachers in general. And 69% said they do not believe that there's actually a place called hell. 69% said they don't believe that. Most of them said they do believe in a place called heaven. Isn't that interesting? The same the word that tells us about heaven tells us about hell. And if you cannot believe one, you cannot believe the other. But nevertheless, there are people who say hell doesn't exist. I don't believe that's true of any of us. I do not believe that's true of you. We know hell exists. What I'm saying is, I think from a practical standpoint, we have forgotten it. When is the last time you considered hell and what it would be like to be lost, what it would be like for those neighbors, those relatives, those co-workers, those friends of yours to be in hell. Would you turn with me in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want to read just one passage to remind us that there really is hell. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Starting at verse 7. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us all uh, as well, when the Lord 
Jesus shall re be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these, get this, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Sounds to me like there really is a hell. And we need to be reminded of that. That's not pleasant. It isn't pleasant. Tomorrow is going to be much more pleasant, okay? Come back tomorrow, I promise. But tonight, we have to be reminded, don't we? We have to be reminded. There really is a place called hell. The second thing we've forgotten. We've forgotten there really is a hell. But I also believe we have forgotten that hell really is miserable. That hell really is miserable. That it is the most wretched, horrible place that we can even consider. So hell is not just some corner in which the naughty child must sit and think about what he's done. That's not hell at all. Hell is not a spanking that God gives at the hand of the devil to those who have been naughty. That's not what hell is, not according to the Bible. Instead, hell is a horrible, wretched, miserable place. And it really does exist. I want you to notice a few words that the Bible often uses to describe this place called hell. The first one is darkness. Hell is described as being a place of darkness. For example, and I'm just going to read, just going to give you a few passages that you can maybe take notes and look up later or preach this later as well. The blackness of darkness, Jude 13. Think about that, the blackness of darkness. One of the things I do enjoy doing is scuba diving. And I have been at the bottom of the ocean at night and turn out the light. And yes, I actually do that for enjoyment. But I'm telling you, that darkness is so black it almost feels like it's smothering you and I cannot comprehend spending one night like that let alone all of eternity it's called chains of darkness second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 the chains it is it's so dark that it just feels like it's chains around you the blackness of darkness the chains of darkness this is the word that God uses to describe this place. There's another word that is often used uh, in, in association with hell, and it has to do with pain. Pain. Weeping and what? Gnashing of teeth. Have you ever been in such pain that you gnashed your teeth? I have. And when you reach that point of pain, you know you have almost reached the maximum that you can possibly stand. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 42 is one example of many. The wailing, the groaning, the torment. What about this? Have you ever considered what it would be like not only for you to be wailing and torment, but to constantly hear others? doing the same pain it's a place of darkness it is a place of place of pain and it's a place of fire fire is the other word that we often see describing hell have you ever smelled singed hair you ever been in some extremely hot place on a hot day and you can almost not even breathe but that's nothing. It's nothing compared to hell. Listen to this description, these descriptions of hell. 
It's called a hell of fire. Matthew 5, 22. It is called a furnace of fire. Matthew 13, 42. It is described as an unquenchable fire. Mark 9, 45 and 46. It is a fire you cannot put out. It is unquenchable. It is called an eternal fire. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. It is a lake of fire. Revelation 20 and verse 14. And then also one more, Revelation 21, 8 says that it is a, a lake that burns with fire and what? So you know it. We forget it, but we know it, don't we? It is a horrible, miserable, awful place. And I think we've forgotten that. You know, the world around us actually uses the word hell more than we do. They use it in a profane way. They use it in a four-letter word way. They use it in a flippant way. Sometimes we don't even use it at all in the right way. I think we've forgotten that there really is a hell and that it really is a terrible, awful, miserable place. Number one, I think we've forgotten there's a hell. That it really is a place. Number two, I think we have forgotten it really is miserable. Number three, I think we have forgotten that people are really lost. People are really, actually lost. And I think we forget that sometimes. You know, it's easy, isn't it, to, to interact with someone day in and day out and, and lose the, 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 the thought that this person I know and I see, they're, they're actually lost. It is easy to forget that. I'll tell you another thing. I think that we also have been lulled into thinking that if somebody is a nice person, or a good person, or a kind person, then somehow they're just, they're not that bad off. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You see, there are people who are mean, and they're evil, and they're wicked. And we look at them and we think, well, of course they're lost, but, but here's this person, and, and, and they're nice. Oh, you, you could not have a better neighbor. Oh, this, this person is the best co-worker I've ever had. And we forget that they're lost. You see, the Bible says that people are lost and that lost people are bound for that place called hell that is miserable and awful and wretched. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 says that that it is our sins, it is our iniquities that have hidden his face from us. We've done this to ourselves. All of us have. And I think sometimes we forget that. There's none righteous. No, not one. And we've all, we're all due the wages of sin, which is death. It's true for all of us. And I'm afraid we have become insensitive to people's lostness. What about you? I'm afraid we have become insensitive. And again, society contributes to this dulling process. There's so many mean and wicked people that that, that good person appears to be okay with God. Well, they don't lie or they don't steal and they don't kill and they, they would never hurt anyone. But they're still lost, you see. You see, because the Bible says that unless a person's sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, he will die and go to hell. And I don't enjoy saying that. And I hope you don't enjoy hearing that, but we need to be reminded because it is a fact. And I think we have forgotten that. Brethren, people really 
are lost. That should bother us. That should burden us. We should never be comfortable with knowing that. Your neighbor is really lost. Your co-worker, they're really lost. People really are lost. And I think we have forgotten that. There's one more. One more thing I think we have forgotten. I believe we have forgotten not only there really is a hell and that it really is miserable and that people really are lost, we have forgotten, number four, that we really are the ones sent to the rescue. Yes, there are lost people headed for this place. What are we going to do about it? Well, guess what? It's us. We are the ones sent to the rescue. Now, maybe with the first three reminders, you're saying, preach on. When I say there really is a hell, you're saying, that's right, preach on. And when I say it really is miserable, that's right, preach on. And people really are, that's, that's right. But maybe this fourth reminder is your predicament. You see, because you cannot really say, I believe there's a hell and it's miserable and people are going there and then not do something about it. Isn't that right? You see, maybe this one, this is where it gets uncomfortable. And again, tomorrow is going to be different. And, and if you don't like tomorrow, then I'll just leave on Friday anyway, okay? But, but tonight we're going to be uncomfortable because sometimes we have to be uncomfortable to remember what we need to know, to know and to do. And you cannot believe that people really are lost and going to that place called hell that actually exists and not do something about it. Which means we have forgotten. It's not because we want them to go to hell. Not at all. I think we've just forgotten. I mean, we're busy with things, aren't we? I mean, we're busy doing this and going here and planning this and take care, taking care of that. It is very easy to go an entire day and never think about souls, isn't it? It's entirely easy to go a week and never consider the lostness of somebody that you know and try to do something about it. We're not cold hearted, but we forget. And tonight we need to be reminded that we really are the ones sent to the rescue. Oh, but I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about the Bible. Well, neither do I. But what can I do? Well, you know, you know, evangelism, that's, that's, that's for the gifted. You ever heard that? Well, that's just not my talent. Oh, wait a minute. That's nothing more than an excuse designed to make me feel better about me doing nothing. Oh, but somebody else will do it. Somebody else will do it, right? I mean, I'm sure somebody is going to do something about it. By the way, that neighbor, relative, co-worker, whomever, it is very possible you are the only one in the church who knows that person and who has influence over them. See, this idea, well, we're going to let the preacher do it. Well, how many people does he know in your world? Not that many. But collectively, how many lost people do we know? Every one of us has an opportunity and a responsibility to try to reach them. Oh, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I, I don't know how to do it. And I imagine there are a lot of people here who feel that way. I understand that. If you've never done something, then uh, it's very easy to feel like you don't know what you're doing. But you know, there, there reaches a point with anything, I think, that if you become convinced enough that it is absolutely mandatory you do something, you're going to find a way to do something. Now, I want you to imagine this scene. You come home 
and you discover your house is on fire. And you also happen to know that your family members are inside of that house. What do you do? Hmm. You know, I'm not a professional firefighter. I, I've never taken any courses in firefighting. Uh, is that what you're going to, to, to think? No, you're just going to rush in. Why? Because of what's at stake. And all this business of making up excuses and making ourselves feel better about doing nothing is nothing more than just standing on the sidewalk and watching the house burn down. That's all it is. According to Church Growth Magazine, they did a, a survey and found that only 2 to 3% of us, members of the church, are actively trying to reach the lost. 2 to 3%. Think about that. So if you have a church of 100 people, on average, only 2 to 3 of them are actively trying to reach the lost. And again, I ask you, can you imagine a business where only 2 to 3% of the employees are actively seeking to uh, uh, accomplish the purpose of the business. How long will that business stay in business? Not long. Not long at all. You see, this idea of evangelism, it's not some big fancy word that we don't use in any other sector. Let me tell you the best definition of evangelism that I've ever heard. This is so simple. I hope you remember it. Evangelism is simply one beggar telling another beggar where he can find bread. That's all it is. Maybe we ought to stop using the word evangelism. You know, the truth is all of us, spiritually speaking, are beggars, right? I mean, none of us are perfect. Every one of us stand in need of forgiveness of sins. We are all beggars. Here's the difference. You know where the bread is. That's the difference. And you know, when you know where the bread is, you have an obligation to tell other beggars where they can find it too. That's all it is. Don't be intimidated by that. You just are simply telling someone where they can find the bread of life. That's all. That's all. There was, in the U.S., a, a, a real actual court case where a doctor was being sued because he was witnessed to have driven past the scene of an accident. There had been a car wreck, and there were a couple of people who were injured. Someone actually saw him drive past one of the people died, and the family of that person sued that doctor for not stopping. And you know the court ruled against that doctor. And here's what the court said. His knowledge of medicine made him automatically responsible to give aid. You agree? Yeah. It's a lot easier to talk about that doctor, though. What do we know? We know where the bread is. We know where the bread is. And, see, that, and I think we've forgotten. We really are the ones sent to the rescue. Yes, that is an awesome responsibility. It is also an awesome privilege. Is there somebody in your life that when you get to heaven, you're going to say, thank you for showing me where the bread was. Is there someone like that in your life? I bet there is. And what if you are that person to someone else? But then there's the other side of that. I don't know if you sing the song, you never mentioned him to me. Oh. That is the most sobering song in the book. When in the better land, before the bar we stand, 
Oh, it's going well, right? No. Because there's that one person who looks at you and says, you never mentioned him to me. You met me day by day. You knew I was astray. You had never mentioned him to me. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Brethren, we really are the ones sent to the rescue. God didn't say, I want someone at some time to say something to somebody. What he said was, as you go into all the world, preach the gospel. And you know what? All of us do go into our own world every day. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. Collectively, we all go into our own worlds every day. We're not here together all the time. It wouldn't be good if, even if we could. Because we need to be out there. And as we go into all the world, we have an opportunity to share where to find the bread. There was a couple who lived out in the, uh, a rural area. And just beyond their house was a bridge that went over a large gorge. But heavy rains had washed that bridge out. And so when people would drive past their house, not knowing the bridge was out, what, they, what was actually happening was they were driving toward their death and they didn't know it. And that couple would sit on the porch as people would drive toward the washed out bridge and they would just wave and smile. And in a few seconds, you could hear the car go off. You could hear the screams. And a few seconds later, you hear another car crash land at the bottom of the gorge. They just wave and smile as they're headed to death. Now, you don't believe that story because it's not true. It's made up. But you see where I'm going, don't you? Every day we're sitting on the porch. We're waving and smiling. People are headed to hell. Miserable, awful, wretched place. And they're lost because of their own sins. And it doesn't have to be that way, but it is. And we just smile. And we wave. As they're headed toward eternal destruction. Brethren, I'm persuaded that we really have forgotten these four things. And I am also convinced that until we remember these four things and that we'll, when we live under the burden of these four things, we're not going to do anything different. And if we keep doing what we've been doing, we'll keep getting what we've been getting. Which in most cases is not what it ought to be. It is. Tonight, I, I don't I don't want you to feel bad. Well, not too bad. I don't want you to feel guilty. Not too guilty. But I do want you to be bothered. You know, it's okay to be bothered by that. If you're not bothered by that, you ought to be bothered by that. The fact that you're not bothered by it. We're sitting on the porch and we're waving and smiling every day. And people we know and have influence over are lost and they're headed to hell. We've forgotten those four things and until we remember them, nothing's going to change. What are the four things we've forgotten? Number one, the real is a hell. Number two, it's a miserable place. Number three, people really are lost. You know people that are lost. And number four, we really are the ones sent to the rescue. Tonight, I've enjoyed being with you, but I hope you have not enjoyed being here. <laughs> I hope that you're bothered. And I hope you're so bothered, you do something about it. Start small. Think of one person that you know, and I almost guarantee that every one of you had someone's name pop into your mind just then, right? That's the person. That's the person. Pray about it. Be conscious. We need to be soul conscious. 
Start small. Start with that person. Pray about it. Look for ways. Look for things you can say, ways you can encourage, but be soul conscious because we really are the ones sent to the rescue. Amen.